Good afternoon or good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, another live podcast in our Crypto Winter Series. We are delighted to have a special guest with us today, uh, Frank Rotman, uh, who is co-founder and partner at QED Investors, and I think fair to say uh, a fintech legend uh, these days. But before we get into, and I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Frank introduce himself, before we do that, though, just a quick reminder, we have... Um, merged by Lended Fintech, oh, sorry, by Fintech Nexus. I'm still saying the old name. Merged by Fintech Nexus, coming up in London, October 17th and 18th. We're bringing the Web3 um, community together with the banking and Fintech community, bringing them all together to talk about the business of uh, of crypto. So with that, um, welcome, Frank. How are you doing? Uh, doing fine. Very uh, happy to be here. Great for the for the very small number of people who don't know you. Tell us, just give us a quick intro. Yeah, I'll give the the two minute version because that's about how interesting I am. Um, <laughs> uh, Twenty nine years in the the fintech ecosystem, uh, with the the first act being uh, helping to create what became Capital One. So I have an operating background that I spent a bit more than a dozen years there. Uh, building out what arguably was one of the first fintechs, uh, and I played a variety of roles there. Uh, and after that, I joined up with the co-founder of Capital One, uh, Nigel Morris, and we decided to create um, QED Investors, which is a boutique venture capital fund. And it's funny to call it boutique. Uh, our most recent fund is a billion-dollar fund. But <laughs> right. we still think about ourselves in this tiny little industry because I, I still remember what it was like 14 years ago investing right. in fintech when fintech wasn't even a word. Um, you know, so we, we've uh, grown this, uh, you know, boutique venture capital fund into uh, something pretty sizable. We have about 20 investment professionals. Uh, we are now global. Um, we're about to make our, I think, 200th investment, you know, over wow. the past 15 years. That's amazing. Um, yeah, we, we have, gosh, probably about 120 or 130 active companies, you know, still out there. Um, and we have approaching 30 companies that uh, are at unicorn status or greater, where we're the first or second check into them. So right. we have a lot of uh, interesting success stories behind us. Yes, yes, indeed you do. So we're here to talk about uh, crypto here. And, and it's been interesting because I've been following you on Twitter for many years. It's at Fintech Junkie, for those who don't know, um, for Frank. And you tweeted, you've been sort of publicly learning about crypto, I think it's probably about a year ago now, I'm guessing, but uh, you sort of shared your journey on your Twitter feed with uh, some really great learnings. I've been following along vicariously living your uh, your journey. So why don't you tell us a little bit, of, just give us some of the highlights of, you know, just how you've kind of approached this, uh, this new, you know, this new kind of niche of fintech. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because uh, crypto was something that personally I had, I had ignored for many, many, many years. And mm -hmm. I think um, one of the biggest learnings that I have is that you're very colored uh, about crypto by your introduction to it. However you come about it, whoever introduces you to it for whatever purpose, it, it really affects how you think about the space. And my initial introduction to it was actually when I was a high stakes poker player and a high stakes online poker player. And the government was in the process of, you know, trying to shut down all of the online sites. And a lot of the big online poker players, especially the high stakes poker players, uh, they, they started talking about this thing called Bitcoin. Hmm. And basically saying, if you want to play poker and the government doesn't want you to play poker, there's a thing called Bitcoin that is uncensorable, like you can actually move it around in rails that the government can't stop. And if you want to play poker, it's a way of getting money onto and off of the sites. And I remember having conversations with, with a few of the, the high stakes players and saying, well, the government doesn't want this to happen. They are using the Bank Wire Act of 1961 to prevent money from going onto and off of the sites. Right. So I feel like if I'm using this thing called Bitcoin, I'm going around the intent of the regulators, going around the intent of what the government wants. And they said, but don't you want to play poker? <laughs> right. Like it, it was this interesting libertarian you know, conversation that I was happening with a lot of the early people in the space where they said, if you want to do this and the government doesn't want you to do this, this is a way of actually expressing your ideals in an uncensorable way to do the thing that you think is right and they think isn't. 
So my introduction to crypto was around going around the Bank Wire Act of 1961. Right. I, I can't do this, right? Like right. I'm in tech space, like this just feels wrong in so many ways. Now, that was my judgment at the time with a single use case, and it was my introduction to crypto. So I, by and large, ignored it for a number of years. Um, I mean, Peter, you and I go way back to the origins of uh, fintech and kind of the first wave of, of everything uh, happening. Mm -hmm. We were just busy. There was right. enough things that we did understand that were well within our wheelhouse. I mean, like V1.0 of fintech was a lot about reinventing lending. Right. Mm -hmm. And it became reinventing payments. And these are things that we actually understood fairly well, that it was actually easy to ignore some of the things that were happening in the crypto space. And every time I would dip my toe in, I would say, wow, this is really complicated stuff. And I'd get busy with other things. And for those of you who know me out in the audience, like if I'm not like the expert in the space, I feel like I'm the fool and therefore I don't play. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I don't play games where I don't feel like I can give the best advice to the companies. So for a long time, I just ignored the space until it became disingenuine to be able to say to our founders that we give the best advice to our companies, bar none, when a lot of them were asking questions about crypto. And, you know, I personally wasn't able to give them good answers. Right. So at one of our CEO summits, uh, one of one of our companies actually, uh, I was talking to the CEO and he said, well, if you're so worried about this, why don't you just learn it? He said, I, I know you're a good student, like just go learn it. And I said, well, if I do this, I only know how to do things one way, which, which is to go in very deep and become a practitioner and an expert. He said, if you're going to do that, do it in public. Hmm. And he articulated a case for the value that it would create and the honesty it would create about holding myself to the standard of being able to publish what I find and being able to articulate it in a way that no coiners like myself, you know, would be able to understand and follow along the journey. So I committed to him to do it in public and I've been doing that for the past uh, eight and a half, nine months. Okay. Interesting. So yeah, and it's, it's really well worth, uh, yeah, some of your tweet threads have been really illuminating. Um, I think for me and for many others that it's been, uh, it's been great to just to follow along with that. So then talking about, you know, when you're looking at crypto now today and where we're like, you know, the, obviously the price of crypto has recovered a little from, uh, from its, from its bottom, but um you know, we're still in the throes of a crypto winter. No one how knows how long it's it's going to go. But when you're looking at the space, what do you think the biggest impact has been so far on this uh, with this crypto winter? So, when I first started learning about the space, and, and probably everyone who's listening to to this podcast probably has gone through this or is intimidated to go through it. Starting is hard. Mm -hmm. Right, like figuring out where to start, how to start, you know, how to not be at risk of moving around real money uh, through rails that only kind of sort of work, and there's no instruction manual, and there's no Sherpa to really guide you. Like, it's a very intimidating space. And, you know, even me as someone who's been a practitioner for, you know, going on 30 years at this point in all things kind of banking and fintech oriented very intimidating for me as well. And every time that I would hear a pitch or hear about what a particular crypto company was doing, if I didn't understand it, I thought it was me and it wasn't mm -hmm. them. So my, my going in assumption is that I was the uneducated one. I was the one who didn't understand and things work differently here. And that if there was a confusion, it was my confusion, not confusion in the industry. And this went on for quite a while, where as I would say, uh, became more versed in what was happening, became more of a practitioner, became more comfortable, I started asking the deeper questions and didn't feel uh, like the right answer was that I was the problem. Some of the answers that were coming back just didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And I think this crypto winter is basically showing that the things that didn't make sense actually didn't make sense. <laughs> so it wasn't that I wasn't understanding and wasn't up to speed. It's that there were certain companies that were trying to violate 
the immutable physics of banking. Right. There, there, there are physics of banking that cannot be changed. And as much as people want to say, but we're Web3 or but we're crypto, like that can only go so far because it's a technology. Right. And you can't say that a technology solves fundamental industry structures or, uh, or a technology solves immutable laws of physics about how banking works. So it's really interesting because now some of the same companies that I was talking to about things like asset liability mismatches and duration mismatches and, um, you know, understanding the tokenomics about when value is created versus when liquidity is created. Like these were conversations that were very difficult to have even six months ago. Right. And now some of those same firms and some of the investors in those firms are coming around saying, Hey, can we have a conversation about what an ALCO committee does? Like what does an asset liability management strategy look like? How would you solve for duration mismatch, right? How do you solve for run on the bank issues? Like the conversations that should have been happening and, and they were, I'm not saying that these conversations were, um, you know, completely absent, but I think that the level of interest in having those conversations is now at uh, an all time high from at least what I can find relative to what they were in the past because of some of the wipeouts. Right, right. That's interesting, Aaron. And, and, and you know, what to me um, is, you know, you look at the, what's happened and particularly some of the bigger blow-ups. And I mean, obviously we had the Terra Luna blow-up, which was you know, really a unique sort of, a unique kind of case. But you've got many of the the, the challenges you've seen, they, they're in the lending space, a space that you know intimately well. And these are centralized um, platforms that um, you know that really didn't uh, weren't able to kind of be, really they they, they weren't um, you know going <laughs> they, they they didn't really have a model that was um, that was able to withstand any kind of downturn and uh, clearly if you're in banking you know that you've got to have a model that that, that can withstand you know stress testing models all the time um, so like it's interesting that. You know, you've seen the centralized companies in the lending space, um, you know, either fail or be or be bought for very for for not much money. Um, and then you've got the DeFi um, lenders that are that is all kind of run by smart contracts. And you know, does that mean? Do you think the DeFi thesis that has proven to be more resilient because we haven't seen a blow up in the DeFi space with these over collateralized um, platforms that uh, where people are people are pledging crypto and, and borrowing money, but we've seen it in the centralized platforms. What does that what does that actually say to you? So I've I've heard this narrative so many times that they're they're using the the data, the observation that the C5 platforms have failed and the DeFi platforms haven't mm -hmm. to jump to the conclusion that DeFi works and C5 doesn't. Right. Right. And, and that is uh, that is more than a giant leap of faith. It's basically connecting dots that that should not be connected. Um, I, I think it starts with product structure, like they were attacking very different products. They were trying to put very different value propositions out into the market. So if you look at DeFi, uh, the, the DeFi protocols that are working have continued to work. Um, you know, have proven that the code is actually very resilient are around over collateralized lending, mm -hmm. right? So what you've done is that you've lockboxed basically an asset that you now have control over using code. And if something happens, you have a market that can actually unload that for as much or more value than what you've actually lent out, right? It's a very simple concept. Um, but because of the nature of that product, it's very difficult for that to blow up. So the code executed well, you lockboxed everything or it was staked correctly so that you have access to it in case of, you know, break glass in case of emergency, like you can do that and you can get access, you know, to the, uh, the collateral to be able to sell. And the markets behave to allow them to sell that collateral if they needed to sell it, mm -hmm. right? So, it's a very narrow use case because in the world, how many people who want to borrow money have more than enough collateral to pay for the thing that they want to do with the use of proceeds just sitting around and they are willing to pledge it 
in order to accomplish what they want to with the loan proceeds, right? Like lending is about borrowing a lump of cash today in promise for returning that cash in some future date, sometimes in a stream of payments over time. Um, and it's about that trade, right? Utility today for payments in the future. So if you think about the use cases for over collateralized lending, it's very, very, very narrow. And I think what you're comparing and, and the people who are drawing the wrong conclusion is they're taking that very narrow use case with a product that is bulletproofed. And they're saying that that, there, that therefore proves the technology is bulletproofed, mm. but it's actually the product that's bulletproofed. In the CFI world, there's actually unsecured lending going on. And you can say that they did, you know, a marginal to terrible job understanding the risk of the counterparties, right? You could say they did a mediocre to terrible job understanding duration mismatch, understanding how to access the collateral, how to underwrite, uh, terrible job understanding the use of proceeds. Like there are a lot of things that went wrong that were policy oriented and product oriented, mm -hmm. right? Because when you're in the world of unsecured lending, you have to actually have policies. You have to understand who you're going to lend to, how you're going to underwrite those counterparties, when you're going to call capital. There, there's a bunch of things that are associated with that product. And that product has a lot more utility and a, a lot more applicability in the industry, but it's much more difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. So what you can say is CFI had a much broader product with much more utility, but executed against it poorly in terms of policies, procedures, the human beings behind constructing that product. And code executed well in the DeFi world for a very narrow product where the right. product was bulletproof, not the people. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. An interesting take there, Frank. So then let's talk about products. Um, there's a lot of different, you know, products that are being built um, right now in the, in the crypto space. What do you think, um, what, what catches your eye? What do you think is, is most interesting that might have a, an impact on the, on the future of finance? Yeah. Um, Right now, I think a lot of what's being created in the Web3 space are really the primitives that are kind of snippets of functionality that eventually could be assembled together to build working products. And when I first you know, started messing around with, with uh, a bunch of the crypto protocols, the you know, various lending uh, protocols that are out there, the various exchanges, it was kind of eye-opening once I realized that things only kind of sort of worked because the primitives only kind of sort of worked, right? So we're still in that building block mode where people are interacting with things that aren't really built for the common person, you know, to interact with. Mm -hmm. XUIs aren't working, you know, to the same extent that we would expect them to in a Web2 context. Um, there are enough problems where if you, uh, you know, don't have a Sherpa, you know, someone who's been there before you kind of educating you on how things work, you could make some gigantic mistakes, which could cost real money and maybe even turn new users off to the ecosystem completely, right? So you, you have an ecosystem where there are big UX UI issues because the primitives haven't yet been completely built out. And then on top of that, the layer, the application layer needs to be built to assemble those primitives into working products for consumers. So I think that there's a lot still to be built at every single layer within the crypto ecosystem. Mm -hmm. What I will say is some of the concepts that are very interesting um, that, that, actually have a fighting chance of building something that's durable and has real value. Um, one of them, one example of it would be stable coins, right? The concept that you could have uh, an international, uncensorable, universal ledger that has good money on it at all times so that you don't have to worry about it running through multiple sets of rails for settlement. Like that's a very interesting concept to have a single ledger that crosses borders. 
with mm -hmm. good money on it at all times. And unless people really understand like what happens to money when it moves from one bank to another, they don't understand like all of the friction that's involved from a policy standpoint in order to make sure that the money is good money. Right. And I, I think the crypto rails and having a single ledger actually can solve for some of that. Um, but there are a lot of interesting things happening in the, in the crypto space. Um, I, I personally think the NFTs, uh, the NFT technology is going to be one of the first user applications that is going to go mainstream. Um, people who follow me recognize that I've gotten deeply, deeply ingrained in what I would call the, the ethos and the zeitgeist of what's happening in Web3 as much as the actual technology itself. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, taking middlemen out of the equation and putting more power in the hands of people who can actually own things, provably ownable, um, like is a very interesting concept that should uh, reinvent whole businesses. Everything that requires escrow, everything that requires proof of ownership, like there's a lot that's going to change in that space. And I think the underlying technology is, is really interesting. It, it has its problems, but I find it one of the more interesting innovations in the space. Right, right. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so, so then let's talk about banks for a second. That's been, you know, you obviously spent quite a bit of time in banking. Um, how do you think banks are getting involved? I mentioned, you mentioned stable coins. There are some interesting um, things happening. I know you've got the, the USDF um, stable coin from Figure that uh, is getting, getting some banks signing up. But are there like, how do you think banks should or will get involved in a Web3 world? Yeah. So there's a time frame issue here um, where it, it is very difficult to say what will the banks do and what should they do without time bounding them. Right, right. Fair enough. So if you have enough of a futuristic view, you can see everything that's happening in crypto is just a new technology, right? And that technology will get adopted for the use cases for which it makes sense, right? So, uh, I mean, I'm old enough now, you're probably old, you're, you're old enough now, like we can remember when you would refer to a company as a web company, right? Right, like if they had a website, they were a web company. And if they didn't have a website, like they weren't a web company. And I think it was the same thing with mobile adoption. Like there were mobile first companies that had apps, right? And they magically were using this technology to do things in a different way than others. But you would think about them as an app, you know, as a mobile first company, mm -hmm. but it's really just a technology. And eventually when it becomes routine for everyone to have these things, you stop talking about it as a web company or a mobile first company, just a technology layer. Like we don't say, are you a Ruby on Rails company? <laughs> it's just like, it's a solution. It's the technology solution that might or might not be chosen by the technologist to deliver, you know, the solution uh, that, that they want to put into the market, the product or service. So I think Web3 in the long run is going to be a technology layer. And it's really just going to be a more efficient set of Rails for the things for which it's more efficient. And the things that it is less efficient for, I think the old rails actually are gonna stand the test of time or they'll upgrade themselves, but using web two, you know, centralized technologies rather than web three decentralized technologies. Right. And so, so then how does that, how do the, the, just the average consumer, not the FinTech enthusiast, but how does the average consumer, um, take an on-ramp here is it going to and obviously you know there's um you know, we, we've become used to mobile apps i mean most big banks now their apps are excellent i think you'd agree that there's, there's really they really got a lot of functionality and you can do a lot of things um and you know with when you get into the into the the weeds of web3 it's not uh it's very difficult um to to kind of operate so do you like, do we need, do we just need a, a layer, like a, a mobile UI to really have this go mainstream or what's the, what's the on-ramp going to look like? 
Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a general truism that when you're talking about something for the masses, they only do it if it solves a problem. Right. Right. And right now, a lot of the early adopters of crypto, the crypto enthusiasts, are really doing it because they're trying to will into existence kind of an ecosystem that they they want to see. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, again, I talk about the zeitgeist and the ethos of Web3, and it is a real thing. It is a tangible thing. If you talk to people in the Web3 space, they they talk as much philosophically about why they're doing what they're doing and building it the way they're building it as much as they do about the delivery itself and about the right. problem they're solving. Right. And a lot of the arguments in the Web3 space are about what level of of uh, uh, sovereignty do you have? What fealty do you have towards those first principles of decentralization in crypto and, you know, uh, self sovereignty of data and ownership? Like there are first principles that matter to a lot of the early adopters in crypto that to the billionth person when they get onboarded into crypto, they're not going to care at all about. Right. They're going to care about solving a problem. You know, so as I mentioned at the beginning of this, how you're introduced to crypto does, you know, shape your way of thinking about it. If you're in a third world country with an unstable currency, like the problem you might be solving is that you now have a wallet with a currency that's more stable than your own native fiat currency. Mm -hmm. Right. And that might actually onboard a billion people like in the world to, to crypto because there are enough uh, countries where that's a big enough problem that you might be able to create a solution using crypto. But for developed countries like the U.S., in order for it to go truly mainstream, you know, you're going to need that that moment like in Web 1, it was email. Right. Right. Like this magical thing where you didn't have to actually have a, a physical letter that you would put a stamp on and send it in the mail. Like you could communicate instantaneously with someone through your computer. Right. And with the phone, it was SMS. And there are some other things that were placed on the phone that made it kind of. I am back. Okay. <laughs> Somehow uh, the the internet did not like what I was saying about the internet, so it. Uh, <laughs> right. I, I, well, I think I, I lost. I, we lost you just after the email um, example. Yeah. So I, we I, will we'll edit this out, but so maybe you can just go back. Um, go back. Yeah, I mean, like Web One, the the moment for adoption was the product called email, mm -hmm. right? and the ability for people to instantaneously send messages to each other um, without having to put stamps on things and write things on paper. And I think Web3 is going to need that same moment. And for a lot of new technologies, uh, if you look for what leads, you know, what gets adoption, it tends to be things around entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I think therefore, you know, the NFT space probably has the best fighting chance. Right. of actually creating utility around uh you know various forms of entertainment whether it's the music industry or whether it's um, the art industry or you know fill in the blank um gated access to things with provability of ownership like there's a lot of characteristics of nfts that you could build products around that i think could gain mass adoption right yeah that, that, that's interesting so then let's close with just uh um looking looking down the road um and i know this is going to be um a difficult it's a difficult question because we have no idea whether this crypto winter is going to last three more months 12 months five years um forever but what are you what's your best guess on when we when we get out of this crypto winter when crypto 
um, not just prices are uh, back to where they were, but um, you know, the, there's more and more technology. The NFT space is becoming more developed. And uh, what, um, how do you think we'll look back at this particular time period? So I think it's actually healthy to flush out um, broken business models, right? In some ways, it creates the clarity that the next generation of builders can avoid mistakes and build more durable businesses, right? So the analogy that that you know I have in the space, and some people laugh at it, but I find it very true, is that you know you have a bunch of people who were looking at crypto very early on you know, and looking at the whole Web3 space. And there was a field in front of them, and there was a sign that said landmines. <laughs> field just full of landmines. But right on the other side of the field, there were pots of gold and diamonds, like, sitting on the ground just waiting to be picked up. So the first dozen people just ran across the field, and they didn't blow up. So they got to the other side, and they've got all the gold, and they've got all the diamonds, and everyone else is looking at them saying, like, who cares if there are landmines in here? Who cares if you'll blow up? Like, 12 people just proved that you could run across the field without blowing up. Now those same 12 people are trying to come back with the riches, and they're blowing up. Right. And people are saying, do you know what landmines look like? Do you know how to detect <laughs> them? Do you know how we can get across this field and hopefully come back safely? Like, you're asking the right questions now so that you could build a business that can actually go get the gold and actually come back with it so that you build something that's much more durable and sustainable as a real business. And I think this crypto winter is going to be looked at as very healthy for flushing out um, at least one batch of unhealthy behaviors and business models. And it's allowing some of the fundamentalists to ask the right questions and hopefully get answers. Okay, well, let's um, we'll have to leave it there, Frank. Super interesting. Really appreciate you coming on our show. Um, this will, you know, this, this I feel like we have so much, so many great nuggets of uh, information there. So thanks again, Frank. Mm -hmm.